I nearly drowned two weeks ago, and it changed my life. My family moved out to Mercy Shores recently. It's a little peninsula down in Washington, with two hardware stores, a Walmart, and not much else. Mom and Dad grew up in San Diego, amongst the hustle and bustle of city life, and decided they wanted to retire somewhere a little quieter. I had been their last child, a total surprise to both of them at 40. Now that they were 55, they felt it was time to retire and enjoy their golden years. So they moved me 400 miles away from my friends, my school, and anyone I had ever known so they could enjoy those golden years. We moved into a beach house of sorts. It was a two-story, the second floor a loft that overlooked the ocean out of a big round bay window. They gave me the loft and took a larger room downstairs with a less spectacular view, knowing I was not happy about leaving my friends behind. I guess my parents were trying to placate me, so I set up my meager possessions that I had brought with us, the moving truck being a couple of days behind. As I set about finding a home for things, I found myself drawn to the big bay window that overlooked our little stretch of beach. The shore was far from picturesque. Not quite as pretty as the California beaches, Mercy Shore was stony and a little bleak looking. I didn't doubt the water would be cold and clear, but it would also likely have rocks and maybe crabs scuttling underfoot. There was a tall jut of rock just off the coast, about 50 feet from the shore. I found my gaze drawn there again and again. It looked like nothing so much as a tall throne fit for a giant. The seat was smooth from many tides. I almost thought I could see a little hollow in the back of the throne. The throne wasn't quite large enough for caves, but there was a narrow fluted passage in the throne's back that would likely fill with water when the waves crushed over it. Those waves woke me up that first night. The crashing of the breakers jarred me awake. I realized that they were so loud because I'd left the window open. As I slid it shut, my eyes were caught by the moon as it cast its glow on the stone throne. As I closed the window, I saw something moving in the water. The lean shape crested up and out of the water like a sea serpent, and as it came up, I could see it was a girl. Her hair was long and silvery and lovely. She ran her fingers through it as I stared at her, and she seemed to feel my gaze as she floated like a specter in the dark water. She looked up at me, her smile wide and inviting, and waved a single pale hand at my window. I waved back, and when she slipped under the water this time, she didn't come back up. When I woke up the next morning, I convinced myself it had been a dream. The next day, Mom and Dad wanted to go antiquing in town. I told them I didn't want to go, and they didn't act too put out by my refusal. It was pretty clear they didn't want a complaining teen tagging along and ruining their trip. I waved to them from the front porch as they left before moving upstairs to relax a little. I sat in the window seat of my new room, reading and watching the waves crash when I saw some people walking down with blankets and coolers. They started setting up their stuff, and I noticed most of them looked around my age. On a whim, I decided to talk to them. What was the worst that could happen? I slipped on a pair of comfy shorts and headed out. The beachgoers tensed when they saw the door open, but they relaxed a little when they realized I wasn't an adult. I introduced myself and learned that they were Matt, Stuart, Kyle, and Roger. They had apparently been coming to this beach for quite a while, and said it was a favorite hangout spot for them. Sorry for intruding. Throne Beach has been empty for years, and the old lady who used to live here always let us play here when we were kids, Matt explained. Matt looked like he'd be at home on any California beach. Board shorts, long brown hair cut in that way that's half bowl cut and half natural, a surfboard next to his blanket, and a smile for anyone. Stuart was tall, gangly almost, with buck teeth and thick glasses. He was very pale, and I got the impression that they had dragged him out from under a rock to hang out with his friends. Kyle and Roger looked like a couple of classic chads. Snap brim hats, sculpted physiques, gold chains, board shorts, the works. They slapped my hand when I went to shake theirs, and roared with laughter when I looked a little confused. We became friends in that effortless way teens often do. I hung out with them for the rest of the day. We swam, the water was cold and stony, as I had thought it would be and played frisbee with a big red disc that Roger had brought. I invited them in for lunch, and we sat on the blankets and munched cold sandwiches and chips. The sun was starting to work its way across the sky as we ate. I noticed that mine wasn't the only eye drawn to the big rock out there. Matt was studying it intently as he ate, and it almost seemed like he was looking for something out there. 
It's pretty cool, I said, taking a bite of bologna as he looked over at me. The rock, I mean. Matt nodded. Oh, Matt just thinks it's cool because he thought he saw a girl out there, Roger crowed. Matt shot him a murderous look, but I was interested. A girl? Matt blew out a big, long breath. Well, it happened a few years ago. I was out here swimming with Kyle and Roger, and the waves were a little rougher than I thought they were. We had all been daring each other to swim out to the rock and back. We had all done it since we were young. I was on my way back, and a huge wave crashed over me and drove me under. I kicked my legs and tried to right myself, but the waves kept crashing down. I was underwater, running out of air, and as my lungs cried out, I felt hands catch me. Someone lifted me and swam me to the shore. I was on my knees, hacking up water and struggling for breath. I looked back at the water and saw a girl swimming away. Kyle and Roger came running up then, and when I looked back, she was gone. Kyle snickered, but I was curious. What did she look like? She had long hair, maybe blonde or silver. She looked young. I remember thinking that she was about my age. Her hands felt strong but cold, and I've been keeping an eye out for her ever since. I keep hoping maybe she'll come back. His eyes glazed over a little then, and he stared back at the throne-shaped rock, hopefully. I heard my dad honk the horn on his old truck then, and my new friends turned to see my parents coming up the drive. They had some furniture in the back of the pickup. As Dad got out, he called me over to help him move it. I said my goodbyes and went to help, but found all four of them following behind me, to my surprise. We had the furniture inside faster than expected between the five of us, and I introduced them to my parents. Mom asked if they'd like to stay for dinner, holding up a takeout Chinese food bag. I can get some more. The place next to the antique shop smelled so good that I just had to have some. Maybe another time, ma'am. We don't want to intrude, Matt said. He held his hands up, and I slapped it as he promised that they would see me tomorrow and see if I wanted to hang out. They cleaned up their stuff, and after another round of goodbyes, they hopped on their bikes and rolled into town. Mom smiled. Making friends already, I see. I smiled back, realizing I had done just that. We sat around the table and ate as they told me about their day. My parents talked about the antiquing. The stores in town had a large selection and Mom was in love with several other pieces. I told them about my new friends, and they agreed that they seemed like nice boys. I told them how lovely the beach was, and Mom said she had gotten a call from the movers saying that they would be here tomorrow afternoon with the stuff. Maybe your friends would like to help you set up your room, she asked. Turned out, they did. I spent that summer hanging out with my new friends. We had moved at the very end of school, and next year I would be starting 10th grade at Mercy Shores High. Matt, Stuart, Kyle, and Roger would be starting 10th grade as well. We had many of the same classes, and as the summer slipped away, Matt proposed one last beach day to celebrate the end of summer. It's the last really warm day before fall, and we should take advantage of it. It was a great day. The sun was hot, the wind was breezy, Dad had set up a grill and was cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. Mom had found the badminton set, and we were using it to play volleyball. Mom agreed to play with us, to round the teams out, and she turned out to be really good at it. Roger, Stuart, and my mom creamed Kyle, Matt, and I three to five, and we decided to swim a little after that. We took to the water like a school of fish, and Kyle suggested we swim to the rock. Come on, Kyle, let's not, Matt protested. What's the matter, Matt? You chicken? Kyle teased. I'll race you, I said, starting to swim for the rock, as Kyle caught angrily and lit out after me. You don't realize it from the shore, but the rock is pretty far out. It was about 30 feet from the beach, and you just don't really realize it till you're there. I had swum to the rock before, we all had, but it's never the same trip twice. I swam hard, tearing up the surf as I went, and when I got to the rock, my arms were burning. I hung to the side of the rock like a barnacle, catching my breath as Kyle closed the distance. When he was about three feet away, I dove back into the water and started swimming hard for the shore. I heard him yell, but I ignored him, paddling hard as I made for my friends who were bobbing near the beach. That was when something grabbed my leg. At first, I thought it was a fish that had just wandered too close, and I kicked my foot out to shoo it. When it wrapped its squishy hands around my leg again, though, it tugged me down with a strength I hadn't felt before. I was pulled under the water, dragged beneath the waves, and as I went below, I felt the air rush out of me in surprise. I kicked out, but whatever had me was fast. 
It dodged out of the way of my kicks and continued to drag me into the blackness below. I opened my eyes, trying to see what it was, and I was transfixed for a moment. It was a girl. It was THE girl. Her hair plumed around her like a halo, and as she noticed me noticing her, she smiled at me. For a moment, it seemed like her mouth was too full of teeth, rows of needles that gleamed in the murky depths. She tugged me down, but now I very much did not want to go. I kicked again, but I was losing focus. I needed air. I was losing consciousness. As the blackness swam up before my eyes, I thought for sure I was going to drown. Then, something grabbed me under my arms and tugged me free. The next thing I was aware of was someone giving me CPR as I coughed and gurgled on the beach. Mom's face swam before me, and she smiled in relief as I came back. I sat up, still coughing, and heard someone in the water yelling for Matt. Kyle was beside me, apologizing profusely, as I choked out the last of the water. I looked around and saw that Stuart was yelling at Matt as he dived under again and again, searching for something. What's... I coughed up some water. What's wrong with Matt? Kyle looked out and sighed. He went out to save you. He dove to get you, but he came up talking about a girl he'd seen. He said she had you by the leg, and after he put you on the beach, he went out to find her again. Dad called the festivities shortly after that. Kyle and Roger hauled Matt out of the water, and the four left after saying goodbye and telling me that they were glad I was okay. Matt didn't say much of anything. He looked dazed and confused and kept looking back at the water as they led him back to the bikes. I knew how he felt. I found myself drawn to the water after that. If I had a spare moment, or even if I didn't, I would sit by the water and listen to the waves. I couldn't get her out of my head, that beautiful creature that had grabbed me. Why had she grabbed me, I wondered. She had seemed intent on showing me something underwater. Did she want me to see something, maybe? Matt started coming around a lot more. Not to see me, not really, but I think he wanted to be close to the water too. I caught him down by the water at night sometimes, sitting by the shore or sitting by the beach. He never brought anything, he was always just sitting in the sand and staring at the water. Dad came out and shooed him more than once, and he told me to tell Matt not to sit out there at night a few days later. He could get hurt out there, and I don't want to call the cops on him for trespassing. That was the night I heard the whispery voice coming from the beach. It came through my window and seduced my ears to wakefulness. I sat up, listening, hearing a returning voice that was much less musical. It was no less familiar, though. When I looked out on the beach, I saw that Matt was on the shore and talking with someone. The someone was in the water, and by the sound of it, they were trying to coax him into the water with them. He looked back towards the road, his bike a shadowy hulk on the street, and then again at the speaker. He said something too low for me to hear, and when they returned to that sweet honey sound, he walked into the water, and I heard him splashing as he dove. I ran from my room and went softly down the stairs. I was worried about him. He was a strong swimmer, but the waters at night were likely dangerous. I came out onto the beach, whispering his name so as not to wake my folks up. I went to the edge of the water and scanned the dark ocean for him, but he was nowhere to be found. He had been there only a moment before, hadn't he? I spent a few minutes searching for him, before finally heading inside, thinking maybe I'd been dreaming or something. That was when I heard the voice. Hello, handsome. I turned back to the water. I'd heard a feminine voice speak, heard it plain as day, but all I could see was the black waves as they churned endlessly. It was dark out there, too dark, and I didn't think that anything could exist out there in that blackness. Not leaving already, are you? The voice asked again. It was closer now. And when I looked, I saw a silver-haired girl sitting on the shoreline. It was the same one as before. She was dressed in a green dress, the color of seaweed. Her hair was long and silver and hung wild around her, shimmering wetly in the moonlight. Her skin was like porcelain, so white and flawless, and her face looked like a carved mask made of flesh. Her hands were on her knees, and when she turned, she smiled at me with the most beautiful set of perfect white teeth. She was breathtaking the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen, and as she tugged at my legs, trying to get me to sit, I did. What brings you here so late? she asked in her whispery voice. I... I thought my friend was here. No one here but me and you. Her silvery hair danced in the moonlight as she shook her head. I saw you the first night I moved in here, I said, not knowing why. 
She nodded. I wanted to say hello. Now it seems I have. I don't know how long I sat there, but it was the best night of my life. We talked for hours about nothing at all. She absorbed every word I said, and I basked in her ephemeral beauty. She was a goddess, her skin lacking blemishes or faults, her hair a perfect sheet of silver. We talked until the sun came up, and I remember her looking at it and giving it a little hiss. Come see me tonight, handsome, she said sweetly. Wait, where are you going? Home. I'll be back tonight. Then she kissed me, and my whole world trembled on the edge of breaking as her lips pressed against mine. When I came back to myself, I was lying on the beach. Matt's parents showed up the next day around lunch. Matt had apparently been missing since last night. They were worried about him because he hadn't been acting like himself lately. He hadn't been eating well, his sleep had been fitful, and they had often woken up to find him gone at night. Matt's father had found him on our beach many times, curled up in the sand, and they had hoped they'd find him here today. My parents said they hadn't seen him, and I said the same. It wasn't a lie. I hadn't seen him after all. I'd seen the girl, the most beautiful moon child, but any thoughts of my friend had fled my mind after that. They left to see the sheriff, and Mom bemoaned the luck. She asked if I was sure I hadn't seen him last night, and I said that I hadn't. After lunch, I went up and took a nap. I wanted to be fresh for her tonight. I met with her every night that week. I came up after sundown to find her sprawling on the beach waiting for me. We talked for hours, locked in each other's eyes. Her face was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen, and she seemed to hang on my every word. Thinking back, I don't think she spoke much at all. She wanted to hear about my life, my friends, my hobbies, books I'd read, and anything else that mattered to me. She always left at sunrise, kissing me and leaving me dazed and confused. In town, Matt's disappearance was big news. The sheriff had talked to us a few times, wondering if any of us had seen him. The state police were searching everywhere. Every friend he'd ever had, anyone who could have any contact with him, and every place he might have been was searched and searched again. Knowing him to be a swimmer, they were scuba divers combing the ocean, but their hopes were low of finding him if he'd gone into the water. I was in a daze. My waking thoughts were of the girl, the lovely girl, and when I would see her again. Kyle tried to get me to come looking for Matt with them, but I was always too tired. Mom wanted to take me school shopping, but school just didn't interest me. I was in love. I was in lust, and I wanted nothing but my porcelain goddess forever. My haze held until one day when they found Matt. Kyle came slamming into my room, rousing me from sleep and saying we had to go. What? Kyle, it's too early. I want to sleep. It's 12.30, dude. Get up and come with me now. He threw clothes at me as I groggily got out of bed. What's your damage, man? Why the sudden rush? We found him. My blood ran cold. You found Matt? What's left of him? Stewart's got the sheriff and Roger's staying with the body. I need you to come say your goodbyes before the media circus hits. If you even want to say goodbye. I put my shirt on, glaring at him owlishly. What's that supposed to mean? Kyle glared at me. You're acting just like him before he disappeared. You don't want to hang out. You don't even want to help us look for him. So I'm assuming that you already knew he was missing. I don't like what you're insinuating, I said, starting to get angry. You seemed like a good guy when you first moved to town, but now I'm not so sure. You know something. Maybe not all of it, but you know something. Now either come with me or don't, but either way, it's the last time you're ever going to see him. It's also the last time I want to see you. I got dressed and followed him. Matt, it turned out, had washed up on the beach about five miles from my house. Well, what was left of him had washed up. His arms and legs were picked over stumps. His eyes and nose were gone, ditto for his lips and ears. If he hadn't still been wearing the t-shirt that Roger had given him for his birthday a year before, no one would have known it was him. He was a torso, picked over from head to toe. When we got there, Stuart and Roger were nearby, both of them crying. The sheriff had shunted the two boys away, and as we approached, he raised a hand to stop us. No closer, boys. I appreciate you finding the body, but I need you to stand back. Kyle told the sheriff how they had found the body while riding along the road. We were going to the corner store when we saw him. We thought he was a dolphin that had been washed up until we saw the t-shirt. That's when we came to get you. The ambulance came and took the body away. 
I remember looking at him under that white sheet and still being able to see his eyeless face. I realized I'd been living in a cloud the whole time. I needed to find out what had happened that night, and only one person knew for sure. After dark, I went to find her. She lay waiting for me, the same as always, but when I didn't sit, she seemed worried. What's wrong, handsome? You seem upset. I took a deep breath. What happened to Matt the night we met? Who? She asked, but her voice didn't seem right. My friend, Matt. I think you'd been talking to him just like this before he died. I think he went into the water after you that night, and now his body is sitting in the morgue, half eaten. I took a step back from her. Handsome, I don't know who this person is. Why don't you come sit with me? You can tell me all about them. She patted the sand, and for a moment I saw a hand the color of algae. I saw a hand with webbed fingers. She must have noticed, because the hand was normal again just that fast. I took another step back. Why did you save him all those years ago? Why did you save him from drowning if you were just going to kill him? She looked down, her hair making a sheet in front of her face. He wasn't ready yet. That sent a shiver through me. Ready? Ready for what? When she looked back up, her face had changed. Her eyes were like onyx stones. Her nose had become a snake slit. Her teeth were rows of sewing needles and her grin looked ready to split her full rotten lips. The dress wasn't a dress, it was her shimmering scales, and as she moved, I could see a tail like a carp's attached to her. Her whispery voice was now like a hook dragged across a rock. We needed his seed. Our men are gone. There's no one to hunt for us. We must make some more. We have to create the next generation. My feet were moving backwards now. You killed him for his for his we needed his seed we needed his meat once we were done we gave him back she said her teeth fixed in a lazy grin i don't want to see you anymore i said you're not the person i thought you were i was 12 feet away but i heard her final words on the subject you can't turn from me boy i swim in your veins now you can't deny me any more than he could she she was right. Even as I walked away, wanting to run, I felt my feet trying to go back to her. I had to make myself go inside. I had to make myself go into my room. I had to make myself close the curtains and try to resist the urge to go back to the beach. Writing this helped, but I can't stop thinking about her, even with my mind so distracted. She's never a monster in my memories. When I think of her, She's always the porcelain moon child I met on the beach. She's always the sweet girl whose lips were sweeter still. She's always the subject of my infatuation. I peeked out my window several times. She's out on the rock, sitting on the throne, singing to me. Her song is for me alone, and I know that I will go to her despite my best efforts. Even now, I feel like a swim. Even now, I feel myself wanting to swim to her. Even now, I feel myself wanting to see what she has to show me in the deeps. I have acquired Kazar the Amazing, issue 237 to be exact, and it scares the crap out of me. I'm a collector of rare comics. Well, not really a collector, I guess. I never keep them for very long, you see. I prefer to sell the comics for big bucks. I buy them from Goodwill and garage sales and estate sales, anywhere I can pick them up cheap, really. I'm in it for the profit, pure and simple. But today, I may have found something that I wasn't quite prepared for. Briarcliff Estates was having an estate sale, and I knew that there would be some interesting pieces there. Mr. Briar had died at the ripe old age of 103 and was said to be a notorious pack rat. His wife and son had died years ago, both under mysterious circumstances, and Briarcliff had gained an air of mystery ever since. It was said that his house was full of things, everything from antiques and collectibles to, well, downright garbage, and I wanted to have a look. The sale was even grander than I had expected. There were halls cluttered with antique furniture, shelves full of old books, antique kitchen appliances, Persian rugs, strange art, odd articles from around the world. All the trash had been cleared away, and 
All the items for sale had been tagged and were on display. A large crowd had gathered, and I was more than a little interested in some of the books for my shop. The auction seemed like a total waste of time, though, right up until the last lot. The antique furniture went first, then the old cars from the garage, then the rugs and the appliances, and the strange antiquities. Some of them were pretty grisly. Apparently, Mr. Breyer had been a world traveler in his youth. He had collected things from Africa, Russia, Germany, China, all of them with an eye towards the occult. I actually found myself bidding on a wand made of pure ivory, something my Harry Potter fans would have doubtlessly paid a lot of money for. But a stuffy old man in the front row shelled out about a hundred grand for it, and I sat down and shut up after that. He had long white hair and an imposing beard that hung down past the waist of his immaculate gray suit. He was a jarring comparison to the toad-faced man with the all-black oiled hair on his head that sat on the far side of the hall. They seemed to know each other, know and hate each other. They had several hard looks for each other as they held their complicated bidding war, and their battles bled over into the books as well. They snapped up most of the books, old moldering things with hard to pronounce names, and my bids were mostly shouted over as the two dueled for the remaining tomes. Most everyone else had gone, seeing that these two meant to have the lot. So, when the last lot came up, and turned out to be a box of comics, I immediately threw out a bid of $25. I hadn't expected to see any comics here, my focus being on the antique books, but this seemed to be the only thing that these two weirdos didn't want. The bid went once, went twice, and then sold as the two glared at each other from across the room. I took my box of dusty old comics, and scuttled off before either of them could realize that I had been there. I I didn't realize what I had until I got home. I took them to my office and set to work, first a shower, then a change of clothes. Old comics can be finicky, and I like to be comfy when I appraise them. Then the gloves came on, a nice set of reusable rubber ones, and I put on a hairnet too. Can't be too careful with old comics. After I was set, I opened the box and had a look. I was not immediately impressed. Mr. Breyer, it appeared, had a thing for old Hanna-Barbera comics. There were some Yogi Bears, about ten Huckleberry Hounds, some Tom and Jerry's, and a few wacky racer comics that I'd never even heard of. I set those aside. Hanna-Barbera comics never retail very high, unless you have some of the rarer pieces, that is. They were all in bags, though, and looked to be in pretty good shape, so I could at least get asking price for them. Next came some old Johnny Quest comics, and they also went to the side. Then I pulled out some, oh crap, some old detective comics that looked to be from the early 40s run. They were bagged and looked to be in great shape. I set those on the desk by the computer. Looked like my purchase wouldn't be entirely in vain. There were some other things in there, some well-loved action comics, a few Batman issues from the late 60s, and a single issue of a comic series that I had never heard of. Sitting at the bottom of the box in a plastic sleeve that looked to be caked with dust and I don't know, maybe soda, I guess, was a copy of Kazar the Amazing, issue 237. I had never heard of Kazar the Amazing, and he appeared to be some sort of magician detective or something. I was also unfamiliar with Keystone Comics, and decided to go do some research. As I brought it over to the computer, though, I felt a strong urge to drop it and just walk away. The comic felt weird, even through the gloves, and the bag was tacky in a way that soda usually wasn't. I don't know how to describe it, it was like the comic didn't want to be held. I shrugged it off at the time, but I, I can feel it now as it sits on the nightstand beside my computer. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't want me to touch it. I looked up Kazar and found that it was part of a debut series from Keystone Comics. Kazar was in fact the only comic series they had put out, and it had a very limited run. Less than 500 issues of each comic were ever made, and they were extremely rare and not often seen at auction. Issue 237 was actually the last issue ever printed before Keystone Comics burned to the ground in 1975. The fire was supposedly investigated and ruled as an accident, despite four people having perished in the blaze. Chuck Landstar, the owner, and the writer of Kazar, his assistant, Mike Dre, and the illustrators who worked on the comic, Jug and Dale Treblow, had all been killed in the fire. The series had never seen the light of day again. Apparently this issue had less than the usual amount on the run. Even in its ratty condition, it was worth over a thousand dollars. Cha-ching. 
$25 for $1,000 seemed like a great deal to me, and who knew what kind of bidding war I could get on this thing. I gingerly removed it from the bag and threw it away as no customer would want it in that state. The comic itself was ragged, the spine bent, some of the page corners damaged or missing. The pages themselves looked pretty good, old but good, until I got to a spot near the back. Towards the end, Kazar appears to be casting some sort of spell to summon an ancient deity. He stood in the middle of the circle, laid with etchings and stone runes, and I could see quite a few bodies laying around as well. Some of them seemed intricate and embellished enough to make me think they might be the main characters he'd sacrificed, but I knew nothing of the series, so I could only speculate. There was a dark-haired woman in a slinky dress that barely contained her assets, a blonde guy with a loincloth and a skull helmet, a young boy in a red cloak, and another less buxom redhead that seemed to have died holding hands with the kid. They were all laid out in a circle, and their deaths seemed to have been unkind. Kazar was kneeling, resplendent in his yellow and green robes, as he made his request before the towering form on the horned helm. Its eyes were coals beneath the visor, and its green armor was stained with ancient blood. It sat atop a bone-white horse, steam curling from its nostrils, as it brandished a sword at Kazar that looked big enough to cut him in half. Kazar was making his request, but the words had been smudged. That the figure on the horse didn't didn't sit right with me. Even through the page, I could, I could feel his regard. It was like he was looking at me, judging me, weighing my worth. I closed the comic. No sense getting spooked by some old comic, I told myself with a laugh. I took some pictures next, showing the damage, and put it into a new protective bag. I uploaded the pictures to Comic Squire, the service I used to sell comics, and sat back to wait. I pulled some of the other comics I had piled up towards me and started looking them over so I could post them as well. One of the detective comics was worth about $40, that was cool, another was worth about 30 excellent, and I heard a ding from my computer and looked up to see that Kazar had an opening bid of $500. I typed a message to the buyer, someone named Nilrim, informing him that I was firm on $800 and went back to the other comics. Two of the detectives were so much hamster cage liner, but I saved them aside so I could put them with the bulk lot. Two more were worth about 30, and I had just started looking up the seventh when my computer dinged again. I looked up to see that the same buyer was offering $800, the price I listed it for, and I nodded and turned back to my work. The bid would sit on the site for an hour, allowing others to bid if they wanted, but I figured this guy would get it, and I would be $800 the richer. I'd barely gotten the seventh comic out of the bag when my computer dinged again. A new bid had come in for $1,000. I checked the buyer, and this time it was a new guy named Morgul. He was offering an extra $50 for overnight shipping. That made me raise an eyebrow, but I suppose he wanted to make sure it arrived undamaged. After all, this was a rare comic, and I sent him a message accepting his offer should he win. I had barely sent the message when Nilrim got back to me with $1,200. This went on for a few hours, and as the bids went up, the bidders began to message me. That was when things got bizarre. From Morgul. Dearest seller, the user Nilrim is trying to purchase your wares under false pretense. He is my rival and merely wants to own the comic so that I cannot. I implore you to award the sale to me and ship with all haste. His wording was strange, but it was nothing compared to what his rival was about to send me. From Nilrim. I must ask that you not sell this piece to Morgul. He wants it not for scholarly endowments, but for his power, and it will bring him much. I must have this item so that it can be sealed away from those who might use it for ill. Thank you. I furrowed my brow at this one. Sealed away from those that might use it for ill? It was a damn comic book. I had barely finished reading the message when I saw that Morgul had sent me another message. From Morgul. I see that you have not offered me my preference in this matter. Has Nilrim offered you something more in return for this item? I assure you I will match whatever offer he makes, no matter the cost. That took me by surprise. These guys were clearly serious collectors, or weirdos, and they could likely pay big money for it. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was stay quiet and let these two drive the price up on their own. Simple economics. They wanted it, I had it, 
Suddenly, this ratty comic was looking like a cash cow to me. Even then, I hadn't realized the real value of the piece. I heard the computer ding as a new message from Nilrim came up. Please, I implore you not to be swayed by Morgul's boasting. If he gets the tome, it will be devastating for our world. I implore you to sell it to me. Money is no object. Name your price and I will pay it. I sucked in air through my teeth, my small pile of potential profits forgotten. This fellow had basically written me a blank check. How much would be too much? He had said that money was no object, but there was always a limit. I looked back at the sale and realized that Nilrim had just placed a bid for $50,000. Morgul quickly countered with 60, and the two went right on sparring as I watched. I pulled up Nilrim's message again, and that was when I realized that his profile had a picture attached. I clicked on it and realized that this was the same guy from the auction today. This picture was of a grandfatherly looking man, long white hair and beard that was downright Gandalf-esque. He was in profile in the picture, just his head and shoulders, but I was willing to bet it was the same guy. This Morgul character was likely the other man, the one who had looked like a toad and been afflicted with all that greasy black hair. They were just continuing their antics from the auction, and I was surprised they had any money left after all the crap they had bought earlier. Another message from Nilrim came in, and this one had a link at the bottom to a new site. This must end. Morgul must not be allowed to own this spell. See what it has wrought last time it was unleashed upon the world. The link brought up an article about Briarcliff Estate. Four bodies had been found on the grounds nearly 20 years ago. They had been arrayed in the garden, the photos looking very similar to the one in Khazar, minus the bodies, of course. Those had been replaced with tape outlines, but their placement was undeniable. Briar's wife, teenage daughter, nephew, and the brother that had been killed in what seemed like a cult activity. Briar had immediately been the first one to be suspected, but some combination of money and alibis given out of fear had cleared him. Still, his reputation in the community had been well earned. Had Briar made a deal with that horned demon? Had Briar possibly discovered something that had led him to fill his hallways with junk in an attempt to insulate himself from whatever might come for him? I saw I had a message from Morgul, a message with his final offer. The link in his message was of a Google Maps location. It was, it was my address. His last message was much less formal and much less pleasant than the others had been. I'm coming for what's mine. See you soon. I've been, I've been sitting in my office writing all this down for the past hour. I've locked the doors and called the police, but they don't seem to be taking this very seriously. The numbers on the bid haven't gone up in an hour, and even though Nilrim had won, I'm afraid he's never going to get what he paid for. I can see someone moving in the yard outside the window, but when I try to call the police, it just rings and rings. I, I don't know what to do. I can almost feel this comic watching me, even as whatever's outside keeps moving around out there. The sun will be going down soon. I wonder if they'll find my body here or by some circle in a garden somewhere. My husband Thomas is a writer of short horror, and I'm very proud of him. He crafts these unique little tales about horrific situations, and people really like them. I won't name drop here, but you may have read some of his work if you've been in the community for a while. He writes... A lot, and his stories have been read by a lot of different narrators. Recently, though, things have changed. He's been thinking of narrating his own stories for years, but he just never thought he was up to the task. His voice won't play well with the audience, he says. No one will want to hear someone read their own stories, he says. His stories aren't very good, even though he makes money writing them. He has thousands of excuses, but... Finally, I told him to just try it, and keep his expectations realistic. He gave it a try, and from the first video, things have been great for him, but very strange for me. You see, when my husband records videos, he becomes someone else. It all started with Dr. Winston and the Hospital of Horrors, a series my husband writes. Dr. Winston is... A st stuttery little guy, 
someone who's afraid of his own shadow. And when my husband does his voice, it doesn't even sound like him anymore. I've never actually seen him do the voice. Not really. We have a two-bedroom apartment, so he sets up his studio in the bedroom since our son has the other room. He bought one of those green screen curtains from Amazon and some wall foam to cut down on the reverb, and he pulls the curtain and sits behind the screen as he works. Sometimes I'll sit in bed and listen, hearing the story unfold, and the first time I heard that whispery little voice come from behind the curtain, I had to get up and peek and make sure it was just him back there. His voices are spectacular, and soon he had a dozen or more of them. Lenny Drover, Dr. Winston, Ozark Uncle, Raymond W. Sanders, Dr. Summer, just to name a few, but it's the terrifier that I hate to hear. Tommy Terrifier is a reoccurring villain in his story. Tommy is a creature that hunts children after dark and sometimes leaves them skinned alive beneath trees or on benches or somewhere else where people will find them. He's the antagonist of Corbin Banner, an Atlanta detective, and has become a fan favorite. The people just love the voice he does, the deep, resonating voice that speaks of horrible acts and terrible deeds. I sometimes put my headphones on when he reads stories about Skinner Park, but I find that the voice of Tommy the Terrifier still bleeds through my airpods. Don't worry, little one. I'll make it quick. You won't feel a thing. I'll snatch your skin so fast. You won't have time to... Stop! Stop! Please, no! I shouted one evening, and my Thomas threw the curtain back and looked at me in alarm. What's wrong? Are, are you okay? He asked, the chair falling over as he stood up. I, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I must have dozed off and had a nightmare. He snorted and gave me a cuddle, going back to work as I turned up the volume and tried to ignore the horrible voice he used. We went to bed not long after. The audio finished for the evening, but when I woke up some time later, I saw a light out of the corner of my eye. There was a ghostly glow from behind the curtain, and the edges billowed slightly in the breeze from the AC. He'd left his setup on, the curtain usually covering his workspace, and the chair was lit in the backdrop of the computer screen. I could swear there was something more behind that curtain, but I didn't have my glasses on, and I couldn't see it clearly. As I watched, the chair seemed to glide as it swiveled around. The curtain rustled, ever so slightly at the bottom, and behind that gauzy barrier, I could see someone hunched in the chair. I couldn't see his face, but I could feel his eyes on me. They saw me seeing them, and when he smiled, it was like bugs on my skin. Hello, Poppet. Fancy a stroll by the old canal. I felt my breath hitch, my throat cramping as the terror spread through me. It was him. It was Tommy Terrifier. It was him, and he was just beyond the curtain. When he stood up suddenly, his height imposing despite his obvious age, my throat opened and the scream I loosed sounded like a tornado siren. My husband came awake violently, reaching for the bat he kept by the bedside. He believed that there was an intruder, that something had woken me up and scared the hell out of me. He was out of bed and looking for the source of my fear. And when I pointed to the curtain, he looked confused. He pushed, he pushed the curtain aside with the bat and revealed nothing but the chair and the glowing screen of the monitor. I tried to explain to him what I had seen, but he just kissed my forehead and told me I must have been dreaming. I, I didn't sleep the rest of that night. I found myself watching that curtain, waiting for the creature to return, praying it wouldn't get me if it did. As the sun came up, I 
finally slipped off, waking up a little later when the smell of lunch being cooked hit my nose. The bed was empty except for me, and Thomas had packed his green screen up after last night's scare. I could hear him in the kitchen whistling as he cooked something on the stove, and I crawled out of bed as I reached for my robe. It was Sunday, and our son was likely at someone's house, which would leave the two of us the day to ourselves. I would have plenty of chances to rest, the night before already a hazy memory, and as I crept up the hall, I tried to cover my mouth as I got ready to startle him. My husband, for writing such scary stuff, is kind of a fraidy cat. He puts on a spooky deep voice for his videos, but he's a big old scaredy cat in reality. My favorite thing to do is startle him, something I probably do too often, but as I came into the kitchen, he must have heard me. He never looked up from what he was cooking, but I heard a terrifyingly familiar voice just before I reached out to grab him. Careful now, puppet. You wouldn't want to startle me at my work. I don't know if I slipped when my foot came down, but when I hit the floor, I was already backpedaling. I was scooting away, my fear returning, and when he turned to look at me, I could swear his face had changed. Gone was the beard and glasses I'd grown accustomed to, the thin lips and the green eyes I loved. His face was pale and clean-shaven, his skin pockmarked and cratered, his teeth grinned shark-like from his mouth, thin and needle-like, and I screamed and covered my face as he took a step towards me. I flinched and struck out with my fists as he touched me, and when I saw that Thomas was looking down at me with concern, I, I felt confused. When I saw the trickle of blood coming from his nose, the confusion turned to shame. Jesus, I I'm so sorry. I didn't think you'd react that badly. I, I didn't mean to scare you. I heard you creeping up on me and thought I'd startle you a little for a change. He apologized as he helped me up, but that, that was only the beginning. I didn't sit in the bedroom while he recorded anymore, but that wasn't the last time I heard the voice of Tommy Terrifier. I heard it wafting from under the door, inserting itself in my ears as I tried to block it out on the couch in the living room. More terrifying still, I heard it in my husband's voice as he went about his day-to-day -day life. It was little things at first. Tommy Terrifier had a noticeable British accent, and I began to notice the way my husband pronounced certain words. He never noticed, but there was an inflection on certain words sometimes that made my skin crawl. When I mentioned it to him, he just looked at me strangely and said it must be something he wasn't aware of. Our son, Nathaniel, didn't seem to be able to hear it either, though. When I mentioned it to him, often... Right after it happened, he would shrug and say that he couldn't hear it. No one but me seemed to be able to hear the odd inflection he put on, and I began to feel like they were both messing with me. The other thing was that he started calling me Poppet. First I thought it was something he was doing on purpose, but when he kept looking at me strangely any time I brought it up, I began to doubt. It was like he didn't realize he was saying it, and my upset confused him. We were having problems at this point, fighting over my perceived treatment, and his lack of understanding honestly made it worse. The straw that broke the camel's back, though, was the sleep talking. Thomas had never talked in his sleep. He barely even snored, but suddenly he was talking in his sleep almost every night. Well... It wasn't really him talking. It was Tommy Terrifier who was talking to someone as Thomas lay sleeping beside me. He always just called them Poppet, the name Tommy gave the kids in the stories before he killed them, but it was also the name he'd been calling me for weeks now. As I lay there listening to him talk about all the grisly things he meant to do, I realized that he might be talking to me instead of some random kid he was dreaming about. Sometimes he would turn his head and look in my direction, and I could feel his eyes behind his lids looking at me. I wanted to wake him up, but by now I realized it wouldn't do any good. He would just think I was having mental problems or something, and the fights would continue. 
I moved to the couch that night, and when he found me there in the morning, I told him I was having bad dreams, and I didn't want to wake him up. Not long after that, he told me about a new angle for the show. The fans have really been liking the series, especially Tommy Terrifier, thinking about changing the show up so Tommy reads the stories sometimes. I might get more audience interaction, kind of shake up my listeners a little bit. I tried to be supportive of this, but I was not pleased to hear that Tommy would be making more appearances in his makeshift booth. After that, every third or fourth story was narrated by Tommy Terrifier. Then it was every other. As the voice became a regular part of his show, the night talking got worse. He would say the most depraved things, things I could barely believe my normally sweet husband would say. He would talk for hours about skinning people alive or pulling out their teeth, and I would lie there in terror as it all just played out around me. I'd taken to using sleep meds so I could get to sleep before him, but sometimes that voice would follow me into my dreams, and I would spend my nights in a state of constant terror. Sometimes I couldn't get to sleep before him, but even from the couch, his dark words seemed to find me. I came to realize that this wasn't something he could help, and I stopped bringing it up. He was so excited about his channel that I hated to put a damper on his enthusiasm by telling him how it affected me. Engagement was way up, he would say. He had more subscribers than ever, he would say. People were commenting how much they loved Tommy Terrifier, he would say. Ad revenue was at an all-time high, and maybe he could cut back at work and take more time for the channel, he would say. On and on and on about how people liked that terrifying voice of his. And I would nod and agree and tell him how great it all was. Meanwhile, I was a nervous wreck in my own home, waiting for the next encounter with Tommy. Before long, the show became Tommy Terrifier's Terrifying Tales, and Tommy began to make an appearance in every episode. That's when I began to notice the physical change in Thomas. He was spending more and more time in our bedroom, the door closed and that terrible voice creeping from beneath it. It wasn't just me hearing it now. Nathan had begun avoiding the back of the house, spending more time in the living room than usual when he was at home. I asked him why, but he wouldn't tell me. He said he hadn't been sleeping well lately, and I can relate. He's been sleeping on the couch with me sometimes, and we both shudder when the voice of Tommy Terrifier slips down the hall. That, that was a week ago. Now the only time he leaves the house is for evening runs. He says it's when he gets his best writing done, but I've come to doubt his words. He always comes back sweaty and disheveled, and his stories have taken a very dark cast. They've become less horror and more horrific. The mutilations and violence have reached a new level, and all of it is delivered by the voice of Tommy Terrifier. He doesn't even sound like himself when the mic is off now. His normal voice has begun to appear less and less, and I'm afraid that one day that pale creature will come out of the bedroom instead. It's getting late now, and though he hasn't come back, the police have come asking questions. They questioned everyone in the neighborhood at the start of the violence, but... They had some very probing questions about my husband tonight. Where does he run? When does he run? Had I noticed any strange behavior? Did I notice a change in his personality? Apparently, some of the stories he's been writing lately have been a little too similar to the murders in the park, and the police want to bring him in as a person of interest. I told them he was out running, and they could find him in the park. After they left, I put the chain on and waited for him to come back. He hasn't returned, but I woke up to hear a familiar voice coming from the bedroom. It seems there's a new story to be told tonight, and the sounds of Tommy Terrifier sound almost gleeful. I don't know what to do. I'm not even sure how he got back inside. 
I want to leave, but I'm frozen in fear as I sit on the couch with my son. I don't know if I'm more afraid that the voice will continue or that it will stop. Because if it stops, I'm not sure if I might not become just another one of those tales he reads for his audience every night. I was speechless when she sent me the message. Even her text looked sexy in the pink curly writing she used. It was short and sweet and to the point, but it still filled my chest with a tightness that wouldn't go away. At the time, it was a dream come true. Meet me at the Hotel Aries at 11 p.m. Don't be late. I couldn't believe this was happening. Tonight, I would meet with Lady Dragora. I guess you could say, I have a slight problem with weird fetishes. I discovered pornography when I was young, like most people I know. I was 12, I was horny, and someone I knew said I could find boobs online if I looked. I dived head first into a well I don't think I really understood the depths of. It started with generic stuff, naked photos, short clips from films, and led to my current level of kink. I started slow, it was the 90s after all, and internet connections were not what they would become. I have waited all day for a single picture to load, only to be disappointed when the phone rang and everything was lost. Most of my early burgeonings were done in chat rooms, in the steamy squares of private messages. With both of my parents away at work, I was on the computer every day after school. I didn't discover my proclivity for VOR until I was in college. When you've been cruising the web for as long as I have, you eventually find yourself into some offbeat stuff. You can't experience that much depravity and not be changed fundamentally, and I was no different. I had recently grown bored with my selection of smut and went looking for something different. When I found VOR, though, I knew I had found something special. VOR, if you're unfamiliar, is a fetish that centers around eating or being eaten by something. In the community of niche communities, VOR is pretty niche. I belong to several online communities where we discuss the acts and the aftermath and trade images online. But I only know a few people in my area who are into it. We meet up once a week to have coffee and gush over our favorite VOR videos and whatnot and gush over our local legend, Lady Dragora. Lady Dragora was a legend in the Vor scene. She had a subreddit devoted to her videos, a Snapchat full of fans who hungered for her next performance, and a legion of fans willing to pay exorbitant fees for her live shows and recordings. She wouldn't tell people her age, but most of us guess she's in her 30s. She has this long, dark hair that falls in straight waves of ebony silk, and her eyes hold the slight hint of some Asian parentage, maybe. She's beautiful, she's exotic, and she was a total sadist. Lady Dragora made the kind of videos that were illegal everywhere. She made the sort of videos that came with a price tag payable in cryptocurrency. I had seen other so-called VOR videos before her, but many were obviously fake obviously staged, or obviously CGI. People would eat mice only to have a jump cut before they started chewing. They would dangle CGI mice over their gaping maws. They would pretend to eat things or eat things they were pretending were alive. And after a while, it just becomes a little old. Her videos were something different. The first video I ever saw involved her eating a rat the size of her hand. The video opened on a terrarium full of squirming rats, not mice, sewer rats. And as she approached the tank, they all began to go wild. They ran over the top of each other, squealing in pure terror. It was as though they sensed a bigger predator coming and wanted to be sure her eyes didn't fall on them. She was dressed in what would become her signature black bodice, garters, black choker, black elbow length gloves, and long leather knee high boots. Some videos seem to require music laid over the top, but not hers. When she reached inside the tank, you could hear the rats screaming and flailing inside as they tried desperately to avoid her hand. She selected one of them and pulled him out with a gloved hand. The rat squirmed and kicked, visibly distressed by her, but she paid him no mind. 
She replaced the lid and walked away from the tank with the screaming rodent. Their cries were high-pitched, almost pig-like, and you could hear them off camera in low waves. The video cut to her, holding the rat up to the camera, still squirming and biting as it struggled to free itself. She held it too tight in her clenched fist, and its fur seemed to boil around that fist like water overflowing a glass. I expected a jump cut when she opened her mouth and leaned over the rat's head. It screamed pitifully as her teeth encircled its writhing head. He bit at her, lashing out with those sharp teeth, but if she felt it, she seemed not to notice. It spasmed as her teeth began to close around its head, and I watched, thinking to myself that the jump cut would be any minute now. This will be when the video jags and her teeth will close around a plastic rat. She'll be just another pretender, just another charlatan, just another... The blood flowed out as the rat made its final scream. Her teeth sank into it and tore at its skin. When she came away, she was chewing, 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 and the rat's body twitched in her hand as she ate. The twitching stopped before she went back for another bite, but the blood made a macabre sort of fountain as it ran down her gloved fingers and pattered to the floor. She ate the whole rat, one bite at a time, bones and all, and as the tail disappeared down her throat, I was hooked. I'd probably watched about a dozen of her videos before I dared to show anyone. Sometimes she bit, which was hot, but sometimes it seemed that she would just swallow whatever she was eating whole. She'd worry it down with very little difficulty, her throat bulging as whatever it was slid down, and to me, that was more erotic than the chewing. It wasn't just rodents either. Eels, mice, more rats, chicks, they all went down her throat while my friends and I paid $79.99 a video. Two months ago, she put a small camera on a mouse and swallowed it whole while videoing its descent into her stomach. The camera must have cost her quite a bit. Between the size of the camera, the night vision interface, and the video's price, I knew it wouldn't be something we could expect often. The footage changed the way I'd viewed my fetish. Watching something struggle in her stomach, watching its final moments, was far more intimate than watching her swallow it whole. I told her as much on the comment section of her website. I spilled my guts to her, hoping to impress her, and somehow it worked. I wish... I wish I knew what would come of that stupid comment. I was shocked when she responded. I'd been sitting at the coffee bar with the other members of our group, Doug and Matt and David. We were all discussing the latest video by Lady D when my phone chirped loudly. I looked down to check it and saw a banner informing me that Lady Dragora has responded to your comment. I almost spewed hot coffee on Doug before opening the message and reading what she'd written. The guys leaned in close, wondering what I'd seen to garner such attention. And when he saw the sender, he too almost spit coffee in surprise. I opened her message, and it said eight short words. How profound. I would love to chat sometime. Dave whistled through his teeth. Wow, she rarely talks to fans. You're in, man. And so I was. As they sat crowded around me, I answered her, and she immediately began our strange correspondence. I didn't question at the time, but... The speed with which she picked up our conversations should have triggered a red flag or two. It was as though she were just waiting for me to respond, waiting for her prey to wander into her field of influence so she could snap the trap shut and watch it squirm. For three months, we chatted almost every day. We talked about everything. Music, food, the usual getting to know you stuff. We eventually made it to topics that were a little more personal. It turned out that she held some strange beliefs about life force, believed that consuming the flesh of living creatures would give her their life force and extend her own life somehow. I asked her if she'd ever eaten human flesh, but she just joked that maybe I'd find out someday and danced around the subject. The more I talked to her, the more I became certain that she had traveled much and knew things that I could only guess at. She spoke about distant places and strange customs. If I hadn't been so enchanted by the attention of a celebrity, 
I might have seen the numerous red flags she was putting up. She talked a lot about places you didn't see on the Travel Channel. Sites that didn't have names you could scrawl across a map. Locations both ancient and remote. A month ago, she asked me if I would roleplay with her. I agreed, of course, because I was hooked on her attention. Even in my haze of glamour, though, I knew there was something a little off. Her persona was that of a large reptile, and mine was always of some prey animal fit only for ingestion. She would describe my end, my passing between large and ancient lips, and my slow descent towards the transition into nutrition. I would describe my struggles, my vain attempts at escape, but she would always catch me and describe in loving detail my demise at her jaws. I loved it. After all, this was my thing, and I often walked away from our sessions with a bounce in my step. People probably had a hard time understanding how someone achieves satisfaction at the idea of being devoured, but to me, it was no different than any other obsession. We would roleplay twice a week, her scenarios and story threads becoming darker as they went, and before long, she wasn't just swallowing me whole, but tearing into me and getting a little violent. I was less on board with these instances, imagining myself going through these pains were never my thing, but she always smoothed it over with personalized videos or custom works just for me. She made me feel special, made me feel accepted, and that's what made it easy to draw me in. This was also when I was approached by Justin. His screen name was Furry Locks on the board in question. Until he messaged me, I'd never even heard of him, though it seemed we moved in similar circles. My only correspondence with him was a message left in my inbox one morning. It was hastily written, full of spelling errors, and intrigued me to no end. I read it twice before class, and when I showed it to my friends in the Vore group, they brushed it off as a jealous fan. His message was not long, but it did make me question some rumors I'd heard on some of the other boards. It read, You don't know me. My name is Justin. I understand that you've become close with an internet personality known as Lady Dragora. I don't know how much you know about her, but she may or may not be 100% what she seems to be. I had a friend whom I'd known since grade school. He caught the attention of the lady, and it was the happiest I'd ever seen him. Their relationship was brief, a month or two. Then one night, he told me she'd invited him to her hotel room. I didn't think anything of it until he didn't respond to my calls or texts for two days. He's been missing for three months now, and your new lady friend has either blocked me or refused to respond to any of my messages. I'm not trying to turn you away from your current relationship, whatever that might entail. I'm simply trying to warn you to be on your guard. I was hesitant to respond. It seemed better to just ignore him, but after a particularly grisly RP session a week later, I decided to message him and get some information. I was still very much under her spell, but some of our conversations had made me wary. After all, she was still a stranger on the internet. Growing up in an age of stranger danger, I was very wary of people online pretending to be someone they weren't, a collection of online videos or not. However, my message was never opened, never read, and when the invitation to her hotel room came across my box, I decided to put my fears aside and go for it. That's how I came to be in her hotel room at 11 p.m. She sent me the text around 6 in the afternoon. Meet me at the Hotel Aries at 11 p.m. Don't be late, was all it said, but it was enough to get my blood running hot. The Hotel Aries was not a huge hotel, but it was one of the largest in this part of Chicago. The borough of Chicago was an hour from campus, but I drove the distance gladly. If she told me to drive to New York that night, I'd have done it. And with the invitation being so close to home, I decided I would be a fool not to accept. I told my friends from the coffee shop where I was going. They told me to take some video and let me know when they got home. I set out for the hotel in high spirits, my mind flooded with possibilities. I had arrived early, two hours early, hoping that maybe we could have a meal before, well, before whatever was going to happen tonight. I inquired at the front desk, and the man behind the counter gave me a knowing little smile as he slid the keycard across to me. She's gone out for a little while, but she mentioned that she likely had a guest coming tonight. Have fun, he said. 
I started up to the elevator, wondering how often he'd had to do this for her. How often did she have guests? I took the elevator up to the penthouse and found a lavish one-bedroom suite decked out in rich fabrics and expensive furniture. I recognized it as the backdrop for many of her videos and found a camera already set up in the corner. She had left me a note, too, telling me to make myself at home and that she would be back at 11. The waiting was nerve-wracking. I took a seat on her luxurious couch and just sat there. My mind raced, going over possibilities and scenarios and making me a nervous wreck of anticipation. When the elevator finally came up to the penthouse, I felt a surge of excitement that my patience might finally pay off. She was framed in the elevator door as they opened, and it was the first time I'd ever met her in person. She wore a long tan coat and the same black boots she'd worn in her videos. Her shiny black hair was pulled back into its accustomed tail. As she stepped off the elevator, she let her coat puddle on the floor, and I could see her familiar black corset. She smiled when she saw me, and as I rose to greet her, she held out a finger, indicating me to stand and be quiet. She circled me, drinking me in with her eyes. The hungry way she looked at me made me both incredibly aroused and extremely uncomfortable. She was looking at me the way I look at a particularly tasty meal. Though this was certainly what I wanted, I had never seen someone look at another person that way before. She didn't say a word, just walked over to the camera and pointed it towards me. As she turned, I saw the red light was on. It looked like I was going to be in one of her movies tonight. Don't worry, she said, her voice hinting at foreign places and exotic locales. This is just for me. I'd never post anything online without your consent. I smiled at her and started to disrobe, but she stopped me with a delicate finger. Leave them on. I like to handle the clothes myself. She stepped away from me then, eyes smoldering as she held me in her gaze, and then something happened. If you've ever seen one of those old werewolf movies, the kind where their whole body shifts in a rapid and sudden transformation, then you may have some idea of what I saw. If not, try to explain it as best I can. Her body seemed to ripple, her whole form shuddering like an image in a pond, and suddenly there was something else in front of me. Her body was a long mass of jade scales towering 12 feet high. As it reached its full height, it had to crouch to avoid hitting the ceiling, but this seemed to suit it just fine. It crouched to eye level, its spade-shaped head hovering inches from my body, and I realized that its eyes, those vast and hovering pools of death, were the same as hers. I was trapped by those eyes, like a bird before the snake, and when she struck, I never even had a chance to run. If you're reading this, then your next question must be, how am I even writing this? Being eaten is normally where the story like this would end, but unfortunately for me, it's not. Lady Dragora, that queen serpent of myth, has been dining on humans for a very long time, it would seem. She neither bit nor tore me. Instead, she struck with a precision born of years of practice and swallowed me whole with little effort. As I slid down her throat, I felt the slimy walls caress me and the suffocating darkness inviting me towards terror. She had let me keep my phone, however, and as I wiggled to get it, I could feel a new sensation coursing through the giant muscles that were her body, the squirming desire for more. That's when I realized what she wanted. She doesn't want a quick meal. She doesn't want a satisfying feed. She wants a terrified body to thrash and scream as her body does what it does best. She wants my last few hours to be her pleasure. So I've been sitting as still as I can for the last hour of my life, writing this message to the outside world. I've sent a copy to my friends at the coffee shop, a copy to the Chicago police, and I've posted a copy here hoping that someone will read this and take it seriously. I now know what happened to Justin's missing friend, what likely happened to Justin himself, and the fate that awaits me at the end of my life. I want my death to be the last, though. So if you read this, and you see her, don't fall for her games. Don't let yourself be another meal for Lady...
Mel was having a cup of coffee at his favorite little spot one day, when something would take place that he would never forget. He was sitting at the bar area, people watching, as he often did, when an older man and his granddaughter walked in. The two were a study in contrast, she a young waif so full of life and potential, he a stunted creature whose life was almost used up. His cane was barely audible over the general clamor, but Mel still heard the harsh chock, chock, chock as he walked across the tiled floor. The sight of him made Mel chuckle, though every step seemed to threaten to spill him to the floor. He held the girl's hand in his wrinkled one, and she beamed up at him with genuine love. They were standing in line for a booth, the coffee shop very busy, and as the girl gabbled happily to herself, the old man leaning on his stick, taking it all in as if just happy to be able to still take in anything. Mel felt that his interest was becoming voyeuristic, but he just couldn't look away from the pair. They were so different from the usual people that flitted into the shop, and it appeared that he wasn't alone. Two women had, and one of them had noticed the pair as well. Mel spent some time observing them as well, hoping to see the same interest or happiness that he had felt. But what he saw was very different. The girl appeared to be filled with a mixture of trepidation, fear, and resolve that Mel had never seen before. Mel had felt like a voyeur, but the young girl was like a hawk who's seen a rabbit. She didn't look away, seemed unselfconscious of her attention, and had eyes only for the little girl and her grandfather. The other said something to her, grabbed her arm fretfully, but she pulled away as she said something quick and harsh to her. As they waited, the little girl suddenly noticed the pair and told the girl how pretty she looked. The girl's attention was broken suddenly as she looked down at the little girl in surprise. She bent down on a knee and Mel could see her point to the little girl's shirt and say something that made her giggle. Then she pointed to the old man, her lips asking if this was her grandpa, and the girl giggled as she answered that this was her papa as she clung to the man's hand. He turned to give the girls a slight nod and a smile before turning back to the barista who had arrived to seat them. The two girls watched them go before seeming to decide to come to the bar where Mel was sitting instead of waiting for a booth as well. As they took their seats beside him, the one who had been watching so intently was still staring at the pair as the old man smiled happily at the young girl and the doll that she was dancing across the table. The girl's face kept that same look of resolve. She clearly had something to do, something she was loath to do, but had to do, nonetheless. It was clear that it had something to do with the old man and his daughter. They're quite the pair, aren't they? Mel asked, making her jump as she blushed shyly, having been caught looking. You have no idea, she said, her accent strange and exotic. Mel thought she might be from the Middle East, or maybe Northern Europe. The barista came around about that time and took her order. Mel couldn't help but notice the resemblance. The two girls were quite dark, their hair long and black as it spilled down their backs. And as the one with the intense stare leaned in to whisper to the waitress, Mel saw the new girl look over at the pair sitting at the table. She nodded and brought the two girls coffee as she went to bustle in the kitchen. Do you know them? Mel asked, becoming very curious as the exchange went on. Unfortunately, I do, the girl told him, sipping her coffee. The longer he looked at the girl, the more Mel suspected that she was foreign. This was Sweden, of course. There were foreigners everywhere these days. But she also looked foreign in that way that people look out of time. The girl, as he thought of her, was likely in her mid-twenties, but her eyes led him to believe that she had lived more in those twenty years than Mel had in his thirty-seven. She had lived through terrible times, seen atrocities, and had come out on the other side. He noticed movement from the table where the little girl sat with her father, and she squealed a little as a mountain of whipped cream and sprinkles was delivered atop some chocolate confection. To the father went a far more sensible coffee and a scone, and Mel thought the old man might have made out better. The shop's scones were to die for, and were less likely to put you into diabetic shock. 
You probably just made that little girl's day, Mel said offhandedly, guessing the woman had sent the order there. She sighed. I hope so. I would like to give her some joy on what may be the worst day of her life. Mel looked at her questioningly, but the woman had eyes only for the old man as he sipped before adding sugar to his coffee. I met him in 2007, when I was 12 years old, and I've spent the last 17 years tracking him down. He has been my sole obsession, my reason for living, and every time I thought I might simply lie down and die, his face pushes me on. She stiffened a little as he looked down at the scone, but his granddaughter did something to steal his attention, and he looked away. Must be a hell of a story, Mel commented. Would you like to hear it? She asked, still not looking away from the old man. It appears we have some time. Mel wanted to decline, but instead he nodded as he invited her to continue. It all started when the Russian army invaded our lands. When she started talking, there was no way that he could make her stop. Once she got started, there was no way he would want her to. When I was little, we lived on a farm far from here. Our town was small, little more than a farming community, but we were happy. My family kept goats, sheep, chickens, cows, and horses. We made a living selling milk and eggs, wool and cheese, and our family was large. I had nine siblings, five boys and four girls and we helped my mother and father with the daily chores and the running of the farm. So when the Russian army pushed a little further, we became afraid. We could see the smoke, we could hear the gunfire sometimes, and the army was nowhere to be seen. The townspeople raised a militia, but it was no match for the might of the Red Army. They shot our young soldiers, our hunters, our ranchers, and marched into the town over the backs of the broken. We could see them from our farm. Father had not joined them, and we knew that the bad times would soon be upon us. She paused, watching as the man took the scone in his hand before setting it down again. She sighed, saying something in a language I didn't know, before continuing. We were all brought into the town the next day, some of us by force, and taken to the meeting hall in town so we could meet our new overseer. The mayor had stood with the men of the militia and had been killed, so the man who stood on the stage was as different from the mayor as night to day. The mayor was a big bear of a man, and he was kind to his friends and neighbors. This man, slight and wearing a military uniform, looked more like Father Christmas he was an older man, his face a smiling mask that he showed us with great excitement. His eyes, however, reflected none of the smile on his face. He told us his name was Major Krishker, and that he would treat us as well as we treated him. That turned out to be a lie. For the first few weeks, all proceeded as normal. The soldiers and the overseers toured the town, took in the farms, saw the markets, met the people. The man was courteous, but his sharp eyes missed nothing. The people thought that maybe the occupation would not be so bad. Perhaps he would be a kind overseer, and when he moved on, the town would still be as it had been. They could not have known how short a time that peace would be. It began with simple theft. The soldiers came to our farms and demanded that we give them a portion of our crops. Not much, they said, only an amount that came to around 25% of our total crop. Now, the mayor had always requested a third, so father was excited that we wanted less. The mayor had already taken his share, however, and father told the soldiers this. Taking more would cut into the food we had for winter, but the soldier said he didn't care. You will give us what we ask for, or it will be taken, they said, and thus we gave it to them. 
my brothers, none of whom had gone to fight, became angry at this. But father told them it would be okay. It is not winter yet, and we will grow a little more before it comes. Next came the conscriptions. They told every male over the age of sixteen in the village that they would be conscripted into the Red Army. They would be trained, they would be paid, and they would be able to send money back to their families. Three of my brothers were of this age, and they were taken for training, despite their protests. My father continued to say that this was okay. They would send money back, and our lives might be better. Father had forbidden any of his children to join the militia, but it seemed the war would take them nonetheless. My older brothers left on a truck that day, and we never received money or letters or saw them ever again. Mel began to worry about the direction of this story. He was expecting a heartwarming tale about someone helping a town in a time of strife. He had hoped that maybe the girl was repaying a kindness to the old man, but the longer the story went on, the less and less he thought it was so. Taking another look at the little girl, who was dancing her doll around the sugary confection, Mel thought she looked different from the old man who sat across from her. Her hair was darker, her features less harsh, but she was young and he was very old. With so many of the men gone, next came the brutality. The soldiers didn't need to tax anymore. They came and took what they wanted. Our cows, our chickens, our sheep, our goats, our crops. Even a few of my sisters were taken in by the soldiers and came back with bruises and tear-streaked faces. I was young, but I saw the look they gave me as well. My father kept me home, not wanting me to go to the village, but when the food prices rose and our trade began to dwindle, father found it hard to feed his remaining children. It was only myself, my younger sister Hetz, and my other sister Gretel, and my older sister Farah, and of course my older brother, Philip. Mother and father tried their best, but when the overseer came to our farm one day, father knew he couldn't hide me any longer. He came to the house, introducing himself as if we didn't already know who he was, and sat at my parents' table to discuss the reason for his visit. He insisted I be there, a girl barely thirteen, and I remember hating the way he looked at me. He said he had seen me in the market and wanted me to come and stay with him at his villa, saying he would give me a better life and offer me opportunities I wouldn't receive here. Father knew why he wanted me. We all did, but my surprise was real when he agreed. He took the man's hand and promised to send me to him the very next day. Let us get her ready and we will bring her to your villa tomorrow, he said to the overseer. And the man was happy. He left and father got to work. He knew what it would mean if he defied this man and he had seen the stockades in the square, but he didn't care. They had taken his oldest sons, his livelihood, and be damned if he would let them take his daughter too. Father loaded me into a grain wagon, and my siblings took me out of town. As we left, I peeked from the back and realized I could be seeing my home for the last time. I found it hard to be quiet as we went, and my crying must have attracted attention. Some of the soldiers stopped us and threatened to search the wagon. Farah was the oldest father had tasked her with keeping us safe, and when she offered to go off with the soldiers if they would let us pass, we knew we would never see her again. My brother Philip took the reins, and we left Farah behind. I never saw my parents again. I never saw my brothers again. We kept moving until we came to a town where we had cousins. They helped us and gave us shelter. But I never forgot that man, or what he did to our village. We learned later that he took all he could from the land and left it to ruin. He hung my father and my mother, and took Farah as his wife. 
He left us orphans, destitute, and I've never stopped thinking about that man. When I heard that he had fled here to escape justice after being declared a war criminal, I knew our time for revenge had come. Mel had been so focused on the story that he didn't look back at the man until he started gagging. His hands were on his throat, his face puffing as he hacked, and the little girl was now asking if he was okay. There was real fear in her voice, and people were trying to help him. But in the fuss, only Mel saw the other girl, the one who had come in with the storyteller, take the girl by the hand and lead her away. The little girl looked back only a single time, calling for her papa before the two left. Mel heard the storyteller get up, but before she left, she turned to give him one final detail. The little girl is my niece, Farah's child by this man who is old enough to be her grandfather. Farah died before he went into hiding, but when we heard that he had fled with a little girl, we knew what we had to do. I remembered one other thing when I was planning this. When he came to the house to ask my father to send me, he told my mother three things as she offered him tea and cakes. The first was that he took his coffee black. The second, that he could not abide dairy. And the third was that he had a strong allergy to nuts. She smiled, dipping into a bow was the barista who had served the two, told her it was time to go. When you tell the people how I killed one of Russia's monsters, tell them I killed him not with a gun, not with a sword, but with a scone that hid a hand full of walnuts. <laughs> <laughs>